Can we give God a hand clap of praise right now? Yes, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I am very happy to be in the house of God this morning. It is a good day to be in the house of God. A, I don't want to get wet outside. B, I love being in the presence of God. Amen. Whew, it is a good day. Amen. It is a good day. Stuff might happen. Problems might arise. God is still good. Amen. Whew. All right, let's get into the Word of God. We're going to be reading, continuing our study in the book of Acts. We're going to begin in Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. If you've got your Bibles, I strongly suggest that you... Follow along, even if it's on your phone, if it's in a paper Bible, whatever the case might be, because we're going to be going through, kind of reading verse by verse at a few points, and it'll be good to be able to follow along, read along with yourself. Amen. Acts chapter 8 and verse 18 says, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands... The Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Your money perish with thee, because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. You may all be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word of God. Today I want to talk about how people respond to the word of God. How people respond is very, very important. How people respond when they hear the word of God is very, very important. You don't want somebody with the wrong mindset and the wrong attitude coming in because God's not going to be able to use them. When one hears the truth, it's important to pay attention on how they respond. We are called to be witnesses. We are called to go to this world and tell people about Jesus. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 says you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me. That's unto Jesus. And where does he say? He says you're going to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Does that leave anywhere out? Are we able to say, well, we're in Nebraska, the Bible doesn't specifically say Nebraska, so therefore, we're out? No. The Bible does not specifically say Hastings, Nebraska. The Bible does not specifically say Nate Mueller. The Bible says we need to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. That might be our neighborhoods. That might be our jobs. That might be our schools. The uttermost parts of the earth. We are called to be witnesses. Amen? So the disciples were doing this work. They were busy at work, going through, spreading the truth, and leading people to salvation. Philip was one of these men doing this work. We read in Acts chapter 8 about a man named Philip. In fact, he's pretty scattered throughout the whole chapter. We're going to look at two examples today about people hearing the word of God. And I'm going to be honest, every time I have read this through the the past years, every time I read Acts chapter 8, I read about one event, and then I, I mentally put like a block, like, okay, that's the end of that event, and then I go to the next one. And I don't ever look at how they could be combined, how they can be intertwined, until I was studying for this lesson... And I realized, oh, there's more woven together 
there's more mesh together than I realized. So we're going to look at two examples, Simon the Sorcerer and the Ethiopian eunuch. Our first example is going to be Simon, which we read about in our opening text. If you back up to verse 9, Acts chapter 8 and verse 9, if you're there with your Bibles, says there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and betwitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. He liked having some mystical powers over people. The Bible doesn't say specifically what kind of magic or sorcery he used. It might have been demonic. It might have been all sleight of hand. Whatever the case may be, he was doing it to have some kind of power over the people. He wanted people to fear him. And the, the city did kind of fear him. They were a little scared of him. He, no, everybody kind of knew, okay, don't mess with him. You don't know what he might do to you. Yeah. Don't mess with him. It's a little weird. And Philip showed up. Philip showed up, and he starts preaching the truth. He starts telling people about the good news, the gospel, going through telling them how Jesus died, how he was buried, and how he resurrected. So we must therefore repent. We must be baptized in Jesus' name, and we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's explaining that to the city, and the city buys into it. They receive it. They believe it. They're excited for it. People start getting baptized. In fact, it was, getting, it was going so well, Philip needed help. So Peter and John showed up to help. And things were going good. Things were going great. In verse 13, if you jump down, it says, when Simon himself believed also. Simon the sorcerer believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs that were done. He also was baptized in Jesus' name. And he saw how people were getting healed. He saw these lame men walking. He saw eyes open. He saw ears hearing. He saw people that had never been able to speak start speaking in tongues. And he said, wow, that's amazing. So I'm going to pause right here, and I'm going to give a warning. Miracles cannot be where our faith is based. Faith must be based on the word of God. If we have our faith based in miracles, it's going to lead us astray. It's going to fall it's going to fall apart. Romans, I believe it's Romans. Yeah, Romans 10:17 if I've got it in there, Matt. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. When you hear the word of God, it should be building your faith. Mark 16 and 17, next scripture. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. Notice that beginning there. These signs shall follow them that believe. These miracles will follow them that believe. It is not the other way around. It is not saying, by miracles you will have faith. It is saying, if you've got faith, if you've got faith in God... If you believe in God, there is going to be some evidence following up behind you. It's not the other way around. It's not saying we need to have miracles to have faith. It says we need to have faith and God will move. Amen. Amen. If one depends on miracles to have faith, then if the miracles pause, they think something's wrong. It's that same mindset that if I get sick, then I must have sinned. And that's not right. That's inaccurate. If I get sick, it's probably because I ate lettuce in a, in a third world country. <laughs> I don't even eat lettuce here. What was I thinking? <laughs> no, I loved it. It was a good time down there. <laughs> but... If I get sick, I, it's just because I'm human. Yeah. If my tire blows out, 
it's because I ran over a nail. If my engine stalls, it's because things happen. Things happen. It's not because I've walked away from God. It's, if something happens to you, it's not because you walked away from God. It's because we're living in a human world. And it's the same way with miracles. If we see miracles, praise God. It is amazing to see blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears here, hearing. Okay, you can't really see deaf ears here. But I've, I've, there was a little girl that her deaf ears opened up. It was amazing miracles. But we can't be based on miracles alone. Our faith cannot come from miracles alone. So Simon, nope, I'm getting ahead of myself. People often lacked faith in the times where miracles were at their most. People often lacked faith when there were frequent miracles throughout the Bible. Give you an example. The Israelites leaving Egypt just saw God work miraculously. Whether it was the Nile River turned into blood, whether it was locusts or frogs or the, the, the tenth plague, the death angel, and how they were spared from it. They saw miracles like crazy, yet they had no faith in God. They're out wandering in the wilderness and God is feeding them every day with manna. He's feeding them with quail when they start complaining. He's giving them water to drink out of a rock. They're seeing miracles like crazy, but they don't trust God. They had no faith in God. Elijah and Elisha, when Jesus was walking around, he's he's telling somebody, okay, man, I know you just got dropped in through the roof. You're on a bed. You can't walk, but your sins are forgiven. And there are people that are saying, who in the world is this forgiven his sins? And he says, ah, hang on a second. I'm the son of God here. I can forgive his sins and to prove it to you, Get up, let's go, get your bed and get out of here. Jesus is walking around performing miracles and people are watching this saying, this is is wrong. You're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. You guys are wearing me out. (laughs) So Simon desires this ability. Ability. Anytime there is a spiritual gift that happens, it is meant to edify or encourage or build up the kingdom of God. Verse 18, I know we just read it, but we're going to read it again. When Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands uh, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Verse 19, saying, give me this power. That whoever I lay hands on, I can fill them with the Holy Ghost. If somebody, if, if, if a gift of prophecy is given, if a gift of healing happens, if a gift of some sort, if God moves in some way, it's not meant to build up one person. Amen. It's not meant to build up a person and make it all about their kingdom. When God moves, it is intended to build up the the whole kingdom. Whether it be the church body locally or the church body globally, it is intended to build us all up. Amen? Amen. Simon offered money for this ability, this ability. He thought that he could buy this, showing how very little he knew about God, if we're being honest. Now, money is a tempting device in society. It's been tempting for thousands of years before us. It's not like money just rolled around in the last hundred years and now it's this big problem. Money money can be a a major problem. The love of money, 1 Timothy 6 and 10, the love of money is the root of all evil, evil, which while some coveted after, they, they... have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It happens. People lose sight of God and say, well, if only I could get a little more money. 
if I could get a little bit more of this, if I could work myself a little bit, I don't want to lose sight of God, but I just need a little bit more. And next thing you know, they've completely walked away from God. The love of money. Having a little bit of cash in your wallet is not a sin. Having a lot of cash in your wallet is not a sin. I would love to have a lot of cash in my wallet. (laughs) Thankfully, that's not a sin. But the love of money, when all you you can think about is how am I going to get more? What what do I need to do to be able to get more? We got to pay our bills. We got to eat. So I'm not preaching against money. I'm not, I'm not saying money is evil. I'm saying the love of money, where you've got to do anything you can get to do that. And so Simon had that love of money on his mind. He comes up and says, hey, 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 how much do you want for that? Because I know what I can do with that. I can, I can get a bandwagon, and I'll start tent revivals, and I'll have healings and miracles, and all you got to do is come up and pay 20 bucks in the offering plate, and I'll pray for you, and you'll receive the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right. yeah. If somebody is selling what God gives for free, right. yeah. they are not following God. Right. Yeah. Amen? Right. Right. Simon's heart was not right. He wanted to make riches off of what God gives for free. And so verse 20, Peter rebukes him. He says, your money perish with you. Because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Peter tells Simon to repent. Goes and tells him to repent because even though Simon had heard the gospel had believed the gospel, and even got baptized because of what he believed, his heart was not right. Now, Peter did not tell him, you need to go repent, as the, you need to get out of here, you dirty, rotten sinner. He was not telling Simon to leave. He was not telling Simon, you know, get out of here, you you will never be a part of God's kingdom. He was not telling him that. He was saying, I love how far you've come. I love that you've been baptized. You are doing right so far, but something is not quite right. Your heart is not quite right. Because you have erred a little bit. And that little bit will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. So I'm telling you this because I want to see you succeed. I want to see you. I love you enough that I'm warning you. See, if... if, he would have ignored it and said, you know what, he'll figure it out eventually. He probably never would. Simon probably would have gone off the deep end. So the pastor came and said, you've gone a little astray. This is not quite right. Let's, let's course correct this. And he goes in to a few details. The following verses, verse 21, you have neither part part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Simon, you've done good getting baptized, but your heart's not in it. You're not in this to be able to get closer to God. You're not in this to be able to be able to talk to God and help people. You're in this to make money. And you need to get that straightened out. So Simon asks for prayer. The next verse, verse 24. Simon said, pray you to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And that's really interesting. Because I don't read that Simon ever repented. This man that was on fire enough for God to be able to get baptized, that was following around the man of God, watching people get healed, wanting to be a part of that, even if it was for his own gain, this man, when told, you're not quite right, your heart's not in this, you need to repent, he says, oh, okay, pray pray for me. Pray for me. James 2 and 19 talk about the devils. You believe there is one God, 
you're doing good, but the devils also believe and tremble. See, just, just, having, just having a little bit of fear is not repentance. Right. Having a little bit of fear and saying, oh, yep, okay, that's, that's, I don't want that. That's not repentance. Saying, oh, okay, I messed up is on your way to repentance, but it's not there yet. Simon hears the word of God. He came close to full salvation, but had not given his heart to God. He heard the word. He believed it. He acted on it, but wanted to use it for his own gain. He wanted to use it to be able to make himself rich. Wants to have God help him get rich quick. And that's not going to work. That's not the way it works. So the second person is a man out in the middle of nowhere. Verse 28, I believe, is what it is. 26, 26. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, I need you to go to Gaza. Go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose, and he went, and he met this man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, this is interesting. The queen was busy running the country. It's a big job being in charge of a whole nation like that. And so this man was very important because she was busy running the country. She couldn't do both. Probably shouldn't do both because you don't want to overdo yourself. So she delegates. She delegates. I need somebody in charge of building. I need somebody in charge of roads. I need somebody in charge of law. I need somebody in charge of money. That's who this man was. Kept the treasure. Kept the books. Somebody well trusted. In verse 28... As they were walking along, um, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. In verse 29, the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join yourself to his chariot. So Philip runs over to his chariot. Verse 30, Philip runs over to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And this man answers, verse 31, says, how can I accept someone should guide me? How can I understand except someone should guide me? And he said, Philip, please come up here. If you can explain this, help me out here. See, God will always reward somebody who is seeking after him. God will reward those who diligently seek after him. Matthew 7 and 7. We read, and it shall be given unto you, seek and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8. And everyone that asks receives, everyone that seeks will find, and everyone that knocks, it shall be opened. What does that mean? That means if you've got a hungry heart that is looking for the truth, that is looking for the word of God, God is not going to shut the door on them. Not a, God is not going to be silent to them and say, well, you know what, you're just going to have to figure it out on your own. My, my mom, when I was six or seven years old, had spent years looking for truth. We would go to churches, and we'd be almost there. We would be almost there. And I, I remember some of these churches, and it was nothing like what I felt when we came in here. It's nothing about this, this you know, it's not like we're on holy, sacred ground right now. We're, we're, we're in God's house but it's because the Holy Spirit was alive in here. It's because the Holy Spirit was alive and we walked in here. And I know my mom was like, this is it. This is the truth I've been looking for. This is what I've been searching for. And that's how it is today. If you've got people that are hungry, God is going to show them. God is going to put people there to help them. Just like he did with Philip. This man was out in the middle of a desert looking for God, hungry to know God. 
And God says, Philip, I've got somebody hungry. I've got a job for you because there's somebody who needs to hear the truth. Go out and meet him. Yes, sir. The man heard, or the, Philip heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. If we go to Isaiah 53, chapter 7 and verse 8, or chap, chapter 53, verse 7 and 8. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so openeth not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from the prison, from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. So that is what the Ethiopian man was reading. If we go back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, Who is this prophet speaking about? Who is this prophet Isaiah speaking about? Is he speaking about himself or some other man? And so verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip was able to explain that this was prophecy. Philip was able to show him that this was prophecy. Isaiah was writing about this man Jesus. And this man Jesus wasn't too long ago, he was walking around on the earth. And you know what he did? He died for our sins. What you're reading about there, Mr. Treasurer of Candace the Queen, what you're reading about is a man who came to earth, was God wrapped in flesh, and died for our sins. This prophecy happened so that we would know it was him. See, in 2 Peter 1 and 21... No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that somebody was, was, had too much pepperoni pizza, was up late at night, penning stuff down. Um, let's see, he's going to be like a lamb led to the slaughter. And he, oh, he's not going to be able to open his mouth. His, his mouth is going to be shut. And then God's up in heaven like, man, how am I going to take this and make this into something? No, no, it wasn't some madman just writing down scribbles. Prophecy was God speaking to the prophet saying, I need you to write down this exactly. I need you to write this down because it's going to happen in a thousand years. You won't see it, but I need the proof here and now. And from that. Verse 36, Philip was able to preach Jesus unto him. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What is stopping me from getting baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went, both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. From that, the man was saved. From that belief, from that, that revelation, from Philip walking into the middle of a desert to meet up with a man, somebody got saved. Now notice the differences here. You've got one man that heard the word of God and said, I can make a quick buck off of that. Yeah, yeah. You've got somebody who is all in it for themselves. And you've got another one that says, I've been looking. I've been looking for a long time. Yeah. Amen. I've been searching for some truth. Amen. If we back up to verse 27, when we first hear about this eunuch, when we first hear about this man, thank you, sir. Do you have that one, verse 27? The very end of it, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. I truly believe the whole ride down there, he's reading scripture. God, I want to know more about you. I'm going to your land. I'm going to this place. I'm going to go worship you. I want to know more about you. He gets there and he's worshiping. He's worshiping God. He's trying to get to know him. He's watching other people worship and saying, okay, that's what I need to do. That's how I need to do it. I need to lift my hands. I need to lift my voice. I need to call out to God. 
but I, I, I feel like I'm still missing something. This was a great experience, and he's on his way back, and he's reading Scripture, and he's trying to know more about God. He wants to know the truth, and God says, I believe you're looking. I've ordained a few things. Let's get this going. Philip walks up to the chariot and says, hey, that man you're reading about, his name is Jesus. Jesus came to earth so that we could be with him. Jesus died on a cross for all of our sins. The stuff that we've messed up on, Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to go to hell for it. Jesus died and took our place. And the man says, well, hey, there's some water right there. What is stopping me from getting baptized? And Philip's like, that's a good answer, or that's a good question. The only thing that's going to stop you is you, because it's a free gift from God. And the guy said, yup, let's do it. Stop the chariot. We're going right now, because I'm not waiting a second longer. I've been looking, and I've been searching, and I've been trying to find truth. And I'm not waiting anymore. The plan of salvation is essential. I don't have it in there, but if you've got it in your, you've got it in your Bibles. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Repentance means that I've been doing the wrong thing for too long. I've been doing the wrong thing, and repentance is saying, you know what? It's time I stop this. I don't want to do that anymore. I want nothing to do with it, and I'm turning away from it. That's repentance. Being baptized is getting rid of that ugly stain that sin leaves on you. Getting rid of that ugly stain. It's just the same as if you say, well, I need to clean this dish. But then you never clean it. Baptism is cleaning us up. Cleaning us up, getting rid of that old man, getting rid of that old sin, getting rid of the old habits, getting rid of some of those things. And then the Holy Ghost comes in and takes that place. Amen. Takes the place of what used to be there and helps us live a better life. Helps us live a new life. Amen? Amen. If we could all stand.